Well, is is the um, <clears throat> how would you account for the almost unanimous opinion of um, of uh, liberal Democrats that in order to reduce uh, unemployment, it is necessary for the government to pursue uh, vast spending projects. Well, is, 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 is it, is, since you, you, you speak of this as being almost manifestly ill-advised, the question arises why such superstitions should survive. Well, it's almost entirely the work of one man, in a way a genius, Lord Keynes, who uh, was much more concerned about influencing current policy than about advancing the right sort of theories. And he was operating then in a very peculiar situation. You know, in Great Britain, a successful attempt was made after World War I, which brought a good deal of inflation, to bring prices down to the pre-war level. Prices came down, but wages did not. So you had in the 1920s a position in Great Britain where wages were internationally too high and British Britain had become non-competitive on the world market. So the problem in Great Britain was uh, to uh, make Britain competitive again, and it was clear that this required a reduction of real wages. Notice these real wages have been artificially increased by increasing the value of the pound. So because the pound was brought to its former level, people receiving the same wartime sal uh, wages or an inflated pound <coughs> could buy much more. Wages had not come down. Now, his first argument was well, wages must come down. Then the conclusion, that's politically impossible. So we must find another way, uh, instead of getting money wages down, we must depreciate the pound so that given money wages should correspond to a lower level of real wages. And then by a curious uh, intellectual somersault, I would almost say, he led himself to believe that even bringing down money wages was not any use. It involves a very complex economic argument. And all he said, uh, concluded, was that, uh, well, we must inflate in short. Now, I noticed several things. <coughs> Keynes was a genius, but a genius who spent only a fraction of his time on economics, one of the busiest men I ever knew, but he knew very little economics except the particular Cambridge tradition, and he was much more concerned to influence policy at a particular moment than develop a th true theory. In fact, the last time I talked to him, which was after the war, I knew him very well. Uh, when I asked him, wasn't he getting alarmed about what his pupils, who had swallowed all this theory, were doing after the war when the danger was clearly inflation? His answer was, oh, don't mind. My theory was frightfully important in the 1930s, because then we needed an expansion to correct the situation. Do trust me, if this theory ever becomes dangerous, I'm going to turn public opinion around like this. Six months later, he was dead. And as usual, what happened is that the very doctrinaire pupils of this man did uh, apply to a completely different situation, a theory which was designed to influence policy in a particular situation. The only thing I blame Keynes for is uh, to make his theory more attractive and defective. He called it a the general theory. In fact, he knew precisely that it was not a general theory, that it was an argument to persuade government in the 1930s to do particular things. It was an ad hoc apparatus. It was entirely an ad hoc <laughs> But the whole country could talk for hours, because one of the most fascinating men I knew. But the personal magnetism of this man uh, not only persuaded the younger generation of economists, and if I had been a much younger man and his student, the problems have swept off my feet as much as most of the other people. Like